I heard uh, recently of a, <laughs> a middle school science teacher who was uh, lecturing to the students on the idea and the properties of magnetism and how the magnets worked. And then the next day he decided to give them a pop quiz. And so he said, the first question on the test is this. My name begins with M. It has six letters. I pick things up all day and I hold things together. What am I? Half the students wrote mother. I pick things up all day and I hold things together. Amen. I, I do want you to realize that uh, this is for some a very difficult time. Uh, they don't like Mother's Day because of the, the touchiness of it and, and uh, because of various reasons. But let's don't neglect to honor those to whom honor is due, the Scripture says. Amen. And so there's nothing wrong with looking at it and understanding it. Uh, perhaps you didn't have the best mom in the world, and, and so because of that, you're kind of squirmish on it. I know that some who uh, are mothers today that weren't expecting to be mothers, uh, and so they are, they're dealing with motherhood in a different do direction. Some moms have lost the children, and therefore it's hard for them to you know, deal with Mother's Day with the loss of a child and and I know when my sister went home to be with the Lord, my mom said, this isn't the way it's supposed to work. Parents don't bury their babies. You know, this is, this is not something that happens. And I found that interesting. She called her her baby and she was 40. Uh, so uh, we, we all seem to always have that special uniqueness about it. And, and so some folks, some others are, are raising their children solo today, uh, not because of choice, but because of possible death, because of possible divorce, because of possible singleness. Uh, some have uh, been separated because of uh, sermons on Mother's Day. A lot of folks decide, you know, I don't think I'll come to it. But we can't deny it. It, it is God-designed. You do understand that, right? God designed motherhood. God created motherhood. Jesus Christ gave the epitome of blessing on motherhood when he, by the Holy Spirit, was placed into the womb of Mary and was delivered physically like every other man since the idea came upon God back in the Garden of Eden. Now think about that. If God did not expect motherhood to be a sacred thing, a special thing, surely Jesus Christ would not have become born. He would have just came down. I mean, couldn't God have done that? By the way, didn't he do it in the Old Testament? They're called Christophanies. Jacob wrestled with the Lord. Who did he wrestle with? Jesus. Joshua stood before the captain of the host of the armies of God. Who was that? Jesus. Remember when they fell down at his feet and he didn't stop them from worshiping. How come? He was Jesus. And so he could have just dropped down and said, okay, here's the way it's going to work. But for God to completely identify with man and God to completely let us understand, he understands everything about it. He allowed the Son of God, the creator of all the earth, the, the, the second part of, we call it, the Godhead of the Trinity, became flesh and dwelt among us. And after 33 and a half years on this earth, he's hanging on a cross to be crucified for your sin and my sin. And he made seven last sayings on the cross. Some had to do with forgiveness. Some had to do with his own physical pain and the, of the Father turning his back upon him. But one of the most sacred moments on the cross, Jesus said to John, Behold thy mother. Now think about that. God of all gods, robed in the flesh of a man, dying for the sin of mankind. Are you ready for this? For every sin ever committed from the day of Adam... And to all future sins of those yet born today were laid upon him. And in the midst of that, he said, John, take care of my mama. Mothers are very special people. Jesus saw it, though his own family, remember, we're not sure who he was. <laughs> and because of all those things, we have to to do something this morning that I want to challenge you to do, and that is to become embracing of motherhood. I should never have to preach a sermon like this. But in the society that we live in today, it has made it possible that you and I have got to say things like, we need to honor 
mothers. That blows my mind. It is a privilege that was not only given to the Virgin Mary, but it is a privilege that was given to Eve. And even before she had a baby, her name was called Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now think about that. How, did she, how was she the mother of all living and she hadn't given birth yet? Because God designed her to be a mother. And motherhood is nothing but sacred. It is from God. It is part of the plan of God. Now, it's not a privilege that is given to anyone other than women. Only a woman can give birth to another human being. What an amazing thought. Now, that privilege is not gifted to men. <laughs> it's not gifted to men biologically. And it's not gifted to men illogically. Can you believe I had to say that? Can you fathom the reality that in 2023, a pastor has to stand in a pulpit and let his people know that men can have Mother's Day? I, I, I don't understand. Why is there women hygiene in the men's room? Really? Take some out all, brother, and see if that works for you. Men cannot be women. Men cannot be mothers. It's just that simple. God knew we would be confused, so they only made two genders, male and female. And you go, what do you identify as? Well, I'm going to say this as delicately as I can. Look down low and see. Because that's the way God made you. And you go, well, I don't feel like a man. Sorry. You got the equipment. And because of that, you'll never hear the doctor say to you, You'll never hear the doctor say he's dilating. Unless, of course, it's the optometrist. Can you believe that we have to stand in the pulpit today and say, embrace motherhood? That's the very... Can you? God had Adam. God had Eve. And her first role in life, I know you ladies, some of you don't like it, but get over it, was wife. Then motherhood. By the way, it's still supposed to be in that order. But we should embrace motherhood. We should look at it as a sacred thing that God has done, and God has done it in such a way that it, 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 it's part of our, well, our, our weaving of our fabric of our humanity together for our country, for the world. God has designed humanity in such a way. There has to be a mother and a father, or it doesn't go on. Someone said, we're getting rampant with artificial intelligence. Beats no intelligence. And here we're wondering, are, are we going to create things that are going to be beyond us and they're going to overwhelm us and they're going to take us? Listen, I guarantee you, men will try, but listen, listen, we can't create mothers. We might get some super cells going. And we might get all kind of stem cell research going. And we can grow an ear on the back of a rat. But you will never, ever, without the blessing and help of God, have a woman. 
You'll never have motherhood in a jar. Not unless God designed it that way. And God allows it to happen. And there are some miracles taking place where using God's materials, we can do certain amazing things. But listen, we need to honor and embrace motherhood this morning. Because to some folks, the, the world does not understand what we're doing. Ladies, the world does not understand at all the idea of being a mother. Some women were single, and they will stay single, and they will stay single by choice and not have children. And some will do so on the spiritual basis, on the spiritual gift of celibacy. That they just don't feel that that's part of God in their life. And that's okay. It's a special gift. God will give a special grace for that. There are, are, are mothers today who are, are single mothers because that painful reality is uh, daddy doesn't left out. We've got terms in our society like baby mama and baby daddy. Dear Lord, help us. There, there's, there's a lot missing. And, and it's an attack today. And if you can attack the family, and if you can attack motherhood as something that's ugly and, and, and something that just happened because that white toxic male oversatted you and told you you're going to have my... Listen, I found out yesterday that the greatest terror fact in American history today is white men. Do you believe that? I don't care what color you are. The problem with us is we're sinners. And salvation by Jesus Christ shed blood is the answer to that problem. But in the meantime, we're taking things and we're exaggerating them to the point that it's ridiculous. God-centered marriage, where God has ordained it in such a way and He's given everybody a proper role and the role of a husband and the role of a wife is given. The role of a father and the role of a mother is given. The role of children is given in the home. God tells everybody, here's the way it's supposed to be. And I want you to understand something. When you start, if it bothers you, if it bothers you to hear the word submissive in reference to the wife, you don't understand the Bible. And if it makes you cocky, as a man, to hear that word submissive, you definitely don't understand the Bible. It's not a person. It's a position. There's a role in each set of things. You know what the Bible says? Jesus became obedient even to the death of the cross. He voluntarily submitted himself to the design of God the Father in His crucifixion. Think about that now. Was He any less God when He did that? No. Is a woman any less uh, uh, of a spiritual being that's seen and made in the image of God? No, the Bible says, and in the image of God made He them, male and female, created He them. Do you realize the woman has just as much the image of God in her that man has? Consider the realities this morning, though, that we're attacking the home. And the way to attack a home is to attack each parent in a different way. And so the idea of marriage today has slipped away. It's not a sacred thing anymore. It's just something you do, and if you get old enough, something you don't do, so nobody has to go back on their Social Security payments. Did I say that out loud? Isn't it amazing? Eighty-year-old people used to believe in marriage. Now they believe in shacking up. They used, that's what they used to call it back when, when, when teenagers did it, remember? That boy and that girl, they just all shack up. Well, you're 85, what are you doing? Well, I have a roommate. How come? 
Because if we get married, I'll lose Coach Kirby in this. Where's the sacredness of marriage? The sacredness of motherhood. A treasured vision on raising children to become like Christ. And I know that you don't like this next one either. The reality of home management. that God has laid it there. Women who understand the truth of the Scripture, hear this verse of Scripture and smile. Women who don't have a clue, grin and bear it. Women who disagree with it, just go out that door on Sunday mornings. Amen. We hear things like Titus chapter 2. The aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Watch this. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, the wife role, to love their children, the motherhood role. Can I say to you this morning, I'm glad we've got some godly seniors in our church. I've been able to tell our teenagers through the years. You see that lady right there? Watch her. Watch how she comes in. We did a, a series with our teenagers many, many years ago on, on ethics and, and how to sit and how to walk. And you go, really? That's Christian? You tell me, is it? Doesn't modesty come in somewhere? Don't they need to learn how to sit modestly? If you've ever worked with teenagers, you'll say, yes, they do. Do they not need to? So we were teaching these things to them. And there were so many of our women that I was able to just say, look at any of them. And watch how she treats her kids. Watch how her and her husband talk to each other. And learn from them how to embrace motherhood. That it's 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 difficult. Oh, is it ever difficult, ladies, right? To embrace motherhood. Ladies, mothers, embrace it. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. It's of God. Embrace it as a young single lady. Embrace mother. Embrace it as a little girl. Do you remember when little girls used to play? Mommy? Let me ask you a question. Why is it one of the first gifts you give a child, that's a girl, hopefully, because, you know, we, we have these gender-neutral toys now. But why is it you see little girls who can barely walk running around holding baby dolls? Well, you're choosing their gender for them. Really? She can play with a switchblade and still be a girl. Nothing going to change that. Yeah, okay, we stereotype. I know little girls who would much rather play with a hammer and, and, and chisel than uh, giving mama's little vacuum cleaner. By the way, fellas, don't give vacuum cleaners for Mother's Day gifts. Please. And if you do, it comes along with 1,000 hours of your personal use. Amen? That'll get you out of trouble. won't tell you how I know that, but that'll get you out of trouble. Embrace motherhood. Little girls need to see that. Look at that lady. She's a mommy. Man, think about that. I've heard little kids talking and, and, and playing off on the side. And, and you hear them with that, here's my baby. And here's my, that, that's a good thing. But our society today is saying, no, that's not good. You're warping their mind by instructing them that this is what mothers do. Mothers nurture children. No, they don't. They kill them. They leave them. They tell them they don't know what they are. It's up for you to decide what you're going to be. So you're gender neutral until you're seven or eight years old. And then you get to pick what you... Really? Listen to you. I'm going to, confession's good for the soul, amen? I had five sisters. Do you not ever think I was not in a dress somewhere down the line? 
most of the time not on purpose, but I did say most of the time not on purpose. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I still identify as a man. Even though I can decorate flowers, and I know what some of you are thinking right now. I can embrace my femininity, right? It's craziness that we stereotype everything and we lose what it really is. It's okay for little girls to want to be mommy. And it's okay. Buckle up. It's okay to teach your little boys they can't be a mommy. I grew up with five sisters and my mom. That, that was the leading people in my life. Women, women everywhere. It, it wasn't pleasant. That's why God gave me four boys. Amen. He's a masterful God. But it's okay to let them know that's not what a that's not how a boy does. Now, I'm not saying boys can't do things that we associate with girls, because they can. And there's nothing wrong with it. I, I used to remember how, how, I'll be honest, I was a toxic white man. And I'd see my little boys grab a baby doll in the nursery. And I'd jerk it out of their hand and put a raggedy Andy in their hand. Amen. You don't play with Barbie, here's Ken. Bless God. Right? I really wanted a tough child, I gave him a G.I. Joe. Or a Stretch Armstrong. 15 foot is the max on the Stretch Armstrong. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what are you talking about. It was a great toy that lasted not all day. But it's okay to embrace motherhood. Men embrace motherhood. Not like the illogical morons are. Of thinking that you possess qualities of motherhood. You don't. And with all the surgery in the world... You won't. It's just not going to happen. So men, embrace motherhood. Look back on your own personal motherhood. And look and see. Young men, young single men, embrace motherhood. You go, wait, brother, wait, now, wait a minute. I'm, you know. What do I mean by that? When you start looking for a girl, notice I didn't say when you start looking for whatever attracts you. But when you start looking for a wife to marry, if that is part of God's plan for you to marry, it may not be. But if it is, embrace someone who is embracing motherhood. Now, she may not want to have children, and that's for you and her to work out. But if she doesn't embrace motherhood, that means she doesn't understand the duty of a wife either. Because they were given at the same time. Eve, the mother of all living so that natural instinct that God placed into women that we see and we understand and we see it in the Scripture where He talks about nurture and He talks about all that. Listen, we are made different. And I don't know about you, but I'm kind of glad. Amen? I don't like the way I smell sometimes. But I've never smelled a woman who smelled worse than me. Some of you are going, I have. No, I'm not. You we're, we're different. We're built different. We're, we're designed different. Men honor that motherhood. Listen to what God has got to say about it. Embrace it. Guys, find somebody who really, truly understands scriptural motherhood and what it's all about. And I said all of that for a 24-minute introduction. Let's stand together for the reading of the scriptures. You're nervous. I, I see it already. You're thinking, I'm never going to get mama to the steakhouse now. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses number 14 through 17. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto good works. You can be seated. Now, Paul tells this young preacher by the name of Timothy, I want you to continue. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. What did he tell him to continue in? I want you to continue in the things, right? Amen. Somebody asked you, what did the preacher preach about this morning? Go, I don't know, but we're supposed to continue in things. Right? What things? Well, the things that you've learned. Continue in the things you've learned. Well, you know, we've learned an awful lot of stuff. Amen? Some of you have learned how to play instruments. Some of you have learned how to cook. Some of you have learned how to cuss. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. Some of you have learned how to do all kinds of things. So what does Paul tell Timothy? I want you to continue to do the things that you've learned. Could you be a little more specific, Paul? Okay. How about the things you've learned and you are assured of? Well, that's a pretty good idea. How about I do and continue to do, catch that, continue to do, which means he's already doing them. I want you to continue to do the things that you've learned and the things that you are assured of. I don't like to do things I'm not sure of. Do you? Have you ever? Uh, Brother Red is wonderful to me. I, I, he, he's just great because he loves me in spite of me. I can open the hood of my truck and I'm not assured of anything. Absolutely. You should, he just kind of looks at me and smiles. Like, why has he got that open? He has no clue what to do. And I don't. And in the niceness of it, he won't say, hey, stupid. No, he, he's nice. But I, he, Red never says, Brother Rick, continue thou in the things that you've learned and are you assured of. And I'll look at the battery and I go, I know how to take that out. I'm assured of that. And then he'll remind me, turn the engine off first. Guess I didn't learn everything, amen? But that, by the way, is a quick lesson. You do learn to turn the car off before you take the battery out in, in a lot of cases. Paul says, Timothy, the things you're doing, keep doing them. What's things? The things you've learned. What things I've learned? The ones that you're confidently assured of. The one, keep doing the things that you don't have doubt of. Okay, well... What are they? Well, what are those things? Knowing who you learned them from. Oh, there you go. Keep doing the things that you've learned and you're sure of because remember who taught them to you. Well, that does help. I'll be real honest with you. I, I know even less about computers. Hush. I know even less about computers. But guess what? What I do know, Paul taught me. Sorry, I haven't vented that out loud to everybody. I've damaged your testimony. But you know, there's some things I will try on my computer, and you know why? Because I know who taught me. And if he said to do that, I'll do it all day long. He has taught me the most invincible tool on the computer is the O-N and O-F-F button. If you're scratching your head, push it. And only that one until I get there. <laughs> and I'll do that because why? Who I learned it from. Timothy, I want you to keep doing what you know to do, what you're assured of doing, because I want you to do that because where you learned it. Well, how long has he known it? That from a child. Hmm. From a child you have learned the Holy scriptures you've learned the whole look at what's happened here i've learned something from my childhood that i'm assured of because i know who i learned it from therefore i can trust who i learned it from because i know it's true and i can live my life based on what i'm doing and what was it he learned the scriptures he learned from the scriptures they're profitable timothy you're trying to live the bible son and i'm proud of you you're pastoring a church over in Ephesus that is a crazy filled city. But I'm proud of you because you're learning and living the scriptures. Why is he learning and living the scriptures? Why is he living a scripture that is full of doctrine, is full of reproof or correction? 
It's full of, uh, of instructions and in how to live your life and how to be something. And it's, it teaches you how to live for God and mature in God, how to do good works to other people. Timothy, where did you learn that? Well, I learned it from my childhood. Well, that narrows it down. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Embrace motherhood. A lady by the name of Eunice embraced motherhood. A lady by the name of Lois, Lois embraced motherhood. In fact, Lo Eunice and Lois, all they had was Old Testament scriptures. In fact, in just a moment, we're going to find out that they're Jews. And so they have Judas beliefs, Jewish belief system. They believe the Old Testament. They believed in the coming Messiah. They believed He's going to come one day. They believed in the Ten Commandments. They believed in raising children the right way. They believed in training up a child. They believed, in fact, my, Grandma Lois was able to claim this promise found in Psalm 103. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him and His righteousness unto children's children. Lois, because you're righteous, watch what God will do to your grandbabies. Thank God for godly grandmothers. Thank God for godly women who pass the torch along to their children, and now they get to see their children's children. Brother Peterson over at Lake City, and I'm sure I've shared it with you before, he used to tell me, you're not raising your children, you're raising your grandchildren. You understand that? Because what I teach Josh and Philip, what I teach Micah and Zach, is what I will see coming out in my grandbabies. And I've seen it already. I've seen it already. Y'all see it every Sunday night when I turn on the, the PowerPoint. And there's two-year-old Pearson. He's, a, he's nine now. Two-year-old Pearson doing this. I love you. Took a picture of it. Bless God, it's on my computer. That's my, that's my screen. Where did that start? When Josh was a baby, I used to do this to him. Every time I'd leave the house. He'd run to the window, and the window was just a little taller than him as he would look out, and you could see his eyes. And you see his hand. Tell him he loved me. Where does that come from? Training. Eunice could claim the proverb that says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And guess what? Timotheus is a third generation. Christian. Ah. What happened? Watch this. Watch the walk of his faith. In Acts chapter 16, verse number 1, it says, Then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed. Did you catch that? She grew up in Judaism and she has accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. She believed, guess what? The Old Testament Scriptures that said the Messiah is coming, and she believed when Paul got around on his first missionary journey, he said, let me tell you who that is. That Messiah was Jesus Christ, and she said, I believe that he was the Messiah. Lois looked at her daughter and said, Eunice, what do you think? Eunice said, I believe that he's the Messiah. And so much so, Timothy comes. Listen to this. She was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Did you catch that? What's the missing element of Timothy's faith? It points out his mom was a Jew. So that means she believed in the uh, monotheistic God. She believed in, in Yahweh. She believed in Jehovah God. But see, that's the battle that was going on in her society that she was living in. 
And in her society that she was living in, she was living in around 40 A.D.-ish time. And something strange had begun to happen during that time. The Greeks were rising up in great power. And so here is this beautiful young Eunice, and she marries a Greek, which is another term for Gentile, which is another term for those who believe in the Greek culture. Philosophy, logic, higher learning of intellectualism and education, fathering up of things not of the Epicureans, who were those who believed that must be pleasurable. Life must have pleasure. You only live once, right? Grab all the gusto you can. Or there were the Stoics. Now, this is blow, blow your mind. At the other end of it is they believed in nothing but pain. You can't enjoy life. Life must be miserable. So here in the Greek culture, they have poly, polytheism. In fact, remember Paul on Mars Hill? What did he say? I declare unto you the unknown God. You got so many idols around here. You got one, so you just don't take one God you might not worship. They believed in, are you ready for this? The taking care of Mother Earth. For Earth is God, and God is in all things. And all things are in our deities. Therefore, we must take charge of the Earth. They became the early climate change people. I wonder how many years they thought, said it was born before it blew up, amen? By the way, AOC, we're... Approaching 12. I know my God's got at least another thousand and seven years left for this place. Amen. If the rapture takes place today, a thousand and seven years still before the elements melt with fervent heat. There will be climate change. I promise you that one. In fact, the Greek philosophers used to say, there is no Greek philosopher in his right mind who would believe that a deity would enflesh himself. A direct slur on what John said. And he became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten Son of God. Full of grace and truth. You see, Timothy's father is an unbeliever. Timothy's mother believed. And she trained up her child to believe. Ladies, I do understand. God understands. It's not always easy at the house. You see, she married him before she became a believer. Paul already talks about that later on. You, you don't separate. Don't, you, you, here you are. In fact, what does he say? Because of your behavior, you can win the lost one to you. It never makes mention of, of Timothy's father renouncing his Greek culture and his Greek teaching of the mythologies. But he did have an impact on Timothy. You say, yeah, I know. Ladies, I do know what you battle. When you can't get your husband to come to church, then you try, and then it spurts and pieces and comes and goes, and, and then you got those who they want to sit there and argue at you, and then the first thing they want to do is throw God in your face and tell you all about things, right? Welcome to Eunice's world. Now watch this. How much impact did his Greek daddy have on him? Number one, Timothy's a Greek name. It means honor of the gods. That's what Timotheus' name means. That's Timotheus in Greek is honoring the gods. But when you shorted it to Timothy, it means honoring the God. Guess how many times he's called Timotheus? Just a few. Most of the time he's referred to as what? Timothy. But wait a minute. There's something even else that goes on. You ever wondered what an impact a, a mother who's embracing motherhood and she has to fight at the home for religious teaching and spiritual guidance and she's not getting anything from any help from that fellow who calls himself dad? How do I know that here? Because in Acts chapter 16, when Timotheus comes to Paul, and he talks about his mother Eunice, and he talks about her uh, in the other chapters about teaching him the Scripture. There's something that Paul does that rattles some cages because it's, it's questionable on he was trying to make Timothy keep the law or not keep the law. 
And there was a great debate. And I won't go into what the debate was all about. That's not the issue this morning. The issue is this. Timothy, half Jew, half Greek. What religion did he grow up in? He was not circumcised. In Acts chapter 16, he's a grown man, young man. Paul has him circumcised because of the culture that he's dealing with. To show them, I will claim my Jewish faith and heritage, but I will claim Christianity and faith. But I am a Jew. I am a Messianic Jew. Did you catch that? Greeks would never have had. Why? Because that was the covenant relationship between God and Jehovah, God and Abraham. Not just the nation of Israel, but Jewish faith. Eight days after Jesus' birth, where was he at? Getting circumcised. Why? Because that's what the Scripture said to do. Guess what Eunice had? That's all the Scripture she had. And here this woman raised her son, not being able to let him follow her faith that she was trying to lead him in, that said there's a Messiah coming one day. She had to raise him quietly, teaching him the Word of God, which the only thing she had to teach was what? The Old Testament. And she taught it to him. She taught it to him so much that here's this young, cute little girl who marries this Greek guy. And guess what? About 33 A.D., Jesus ascended. In 37 A.D., you have Acts chapter 9. That's where Paul gets saved. In 49 A.D., you have Timothy joining Paul in Acts chapter 16. You ready for this? Christianity had only been around about 20 years. 20 years. How old do you think this kid is? His mother trusted. His grandmother trusted. They took the Word of God and taught it to him so that he trusted. Here is this young lady who has heard the Word of God all of her life about sacrifices and living this way and the Passover, and she believed in all of that. And then the Apostle Paul comes in one day and says, Let me clarify all this. His name is Jesus. And for whosoever wills shall call upon him shall be saved. And Eunice said, it's good enough for me. Her mama said, it's good enough for me. And they both said, and it's good enough for the baby. Because at this point in time, Timothy's probably not much older than 20-ish. And from a child, he learned the Holy Scriptures. And here he is now, young man, stepping out. To teach and to preach the Word of God. Why? Because that dynamic duo of motherhood embraced motherhood, embraced what the Scripture said, and because of that, we see in Timothy saving faith. Because of their instructions in motherhood. Listen, son, God loves you. And God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. And long Timothy said, God forgive me. I accept Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden we see something else happening. We see him, as Paul referred to it, as his sincere faith. His unfeigned faith. Do you know what that word literally means? <laughs> his unmasked faith. How can Timothy... When his influence was an ungodly dad who wouldn't let him follow his mother's religion, named him after a celebration of his gods, and here's a mom teaching him Judaism that's now in the process of changing over to the reality of Judaism. It's truly been Christianity the whole time. It's just setting the stage for this is the sacrificial system that Jesus is going to be and fulfill and Paul says, you know what, Timothy? Your faith isn't like a faith of a hypocrite. Why? Because his mama's faith wasn't the faith of a hypocrite. He said, your unfeigned faith, which I saw first in your grandmother, and then in your mother, and now in you. You don't want your grandkids to be hypocrites, parents? There's only one answer for that. You don't be. You want to see sincere faith 
in our kids that are coming up behind us, then we better have embracing motherhood faith that the Bible is true word of God and is profitable unto all things and raise our children based on thus saith the Lord. You say, well, Brother Rick, I, you know, listen, I know how hard it is because I get it thrown in my face 24-7. And you're a preacher? Yes, I am. And you're an idiot? What does that... The battle is real. The struggle is real. Mothers, if you don't want your children to ask you the question, are we going to church today? Really? If we show hypocrisy, let your kids see you making out the tithe check. What are you doing? Giving God. I used to give my envelope to the boys. They go put that in the offering plate for dad. You know what that made them want to do? I want one. Well, good. You do some work around the house and I'll pay you. Josh loved the idea. Philip thought it was ignorant. Micah loved the idea. Zach goes, work around the house. We need to discuss this. Number four, amen. I love him. But it, they wanted to put it in. Why? Why? They saw it work with Daddy. And his faith said, I believe God can handle this area of my life. Let me show you how God... And it's an unfeigned faith. It's a sincere faith they learned. You want your kids to pray, let them catch you praying. It's a good thing. Charles Spurgeon <laughs> said one of the greatest prayers he had ever heard that changed his life as an unruly young man, was when he stood, heard his mother praying in the, in the bedroom one night, Dear God, please save Charles, because I will, God, stand before you and condemn him to hell if he does not trust Christ. I don't know if I wanted to hear my mama say that. To know that your mother would be a witness against you because you rejected her teaching of Scripture. That's strong. That's embracing motherhood. That's realizing, listen, it's not the preacher's job. It's not the Sunday school teacher's job. It's not the small group's job. It's not the Tuesday night Bible study at Brother Don's house job. It's not Friday's over at Miss Altimate's house. It's my motherhood's job to teach my babies and my grandbabies the Word of Almighty God rightly divided. And you go, well, I don't know how to do that. That's why we offer lessons. And your kids see you coming. Your grandkids see you coming. They see it sincere. Guess what? You have given them saving faith. You have given them sincere faith. And then what do we see last? Paul said in chapter 16, I want him to go on the missionary trip with me. You see serving faith. You want your kids to serve God. Show them. Show them how. Teach them how. Love them how. Embrace the motherhood of what God has designed for us is to teach us how to live a life of Bible in front of our kids. Four Bible scholars were arguing over various Bible translations. <laughs> One said he preferred the King James that guy already, because he loved the beauty of the Old English. Another said, I like the Revised Standard Version because it seems to be easier to read and less of it to read because they take stories out of it. Another said, I like the Living Bible because it makes absolutely no sense and I don't have to use it. And then the fourth said, I like my mother's translation. They started laughing at him and he said, yes, my mother had a translation of the Scripture. And my mom lived the Bible before me every day of her life. You want to know chapter and verse? Listen to Grandma. How does she handle gossip? Listen to Mama. How does she handle a broken heart? Listen to Mama and listen to Grandma. And by the way, they don't have to be biological either. You say, really? 
You ever notice what Paul called Timothy in the Scriptures? My son. But you know what? There was a gentleman one day who was watching the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and Christ fell down. And they told this young man from Niger, you carry his cross. And his two sons were there. One, his name is Rufus. And in the book of Acts, or the book of Romans, Paul salutes Rufus and his mother and mine. The man who carried the cross for Jesus Christ, his wife, loved the Apostle Paul so much, she treated him the same way she treated her own. It's nice to have moms. And it is wonderful to have church moms. For the last several years, we've done the funerals of so many special ladies who truly believed me 30 years ago almost when they would say, oh my, what are we going to do? And I said, you got a preacher to raise. Don't leave me. Happy Mother's Day. God's going to bless you if you will embrace motherhood from the Scriptures. Live your life like the Bible, and you will be an amazing honor to God and to this church and then flowing to this community. You will have made a difference. Let's pray.